I am really delighted to be here. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me, and I feel um, really honoured to be in front of a group of people who are doing such important work, uh, often in hard circumstances with not very much money, and what feels like um, the tide is turning so that this really is your moment. So thank you for inviting me to share some of the thoughts that we're having in the UK and uh, more broadly about where technology is heading. As Mark said, uh, although he was kind not to say the actual time frames in all of this, you're actually looking at an extinct species because, whoops, I'm a dot-com dinosaur. I was approached on the street recently in the UK and someone said, I know who you are. And I thought, finally, I'm famous again after lastminute.com 20 years ago. And they said, yes, you're that dot-com dinosaur. And I thought, oh my Lord, for a 45 year old, that's uh, some what alarming. But I bring, I think, an interesting perspective because just to spend two minutes on me, my career has been strange. I started lastminute.com with my friend Brent Hoberman back in 1997, 98. We actually got the site switched on. And it was a time when now it's easy to forget the normal was absolutely not going to be putting your credit card details into a website to encourage people to buy things online. That was not normal. We didn't even spend any time telling people or investors or the public or the media about lastminute.com. We spent all our time trying to tell them the internet wasn't going to blow up and that it was actually going to be around 5, 10, 15, 20 years later. That was the normal then. You know, we were at the vanguard of building e-commerce in Europe. But my goodness me, I don't think I could have predicted that 20 years later things would have uh, turned out as they have. You know, the e-commerce revolution feels like a, a long time ago now, and the landscape is so entirely different. It feels naive to stand here and say that when we were building that business back uh, 20 years ago, the internet felt like a place of great hope, it felt as though it was going to empower more people. Here was I, a 25-year-old woman who was building an, a business around Europe with incredible um, speed, with access to networks that I would never have been able to access in um, the traditional ways. And it felt as though there were all these exciting things happening. There's no Google, certainly no Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram, no Snap, all of these uh, businesses were completely unimaginable. And now we stand at a very different place 20 years later. What's normal now? Well, I have just under two-year-old twins, and for them, I think they will genuinely look at me and find it astonishing that I could remember a time pre-internet. We spend more time on our devices and online than we spend asleep as a human race. And although half the world has still to enjoy the uh, technology we all take for granted, we are connecting people at a rate of knots that's quite astonishing. You know, and if I think about it from just an entrepreneurship hat, in London, every hour a new tech startup happens. And that's in London. If you were to extrapolate out to Lagos or to places around the world that you all come from, the numbers would be even more uh, extraordinary. So normal now is very different. But I believe we are at the absolute cusp of a change in relationship with all of us, that all of us have to technology. It feels to me as though the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal that has dominated the headlines, certainly in Europe and more um, broadly around the world, is because of this lightning rod it has become for the unease and anxiety that we as citizens and as users of tech feel about our relationship to it. Dot Everyone did some research in the UK about people's relationship and feelings to technology. And I think it's interesting, and I'd be very interested to hear from you in Q&A whether you think this would apply around the world, but I think it probably would broadly. 50% of people that we talked to said that technology had helped them every day in their daily lives. At an individual level, they felt it was improving their lives, but only 12% believed it was improving society. That's quite a big disparity. So over half of, half of people think it's helped them individually every day, but only 12% think it's improved society. And that, to me, really sums up the anxiety that people feel. They know that they enjoy the cheap products and services, being able to connect with people around the world, being able to find out news online, being able to do all the things that we all know too well. But they have a very deep anxiety about the macro picture and how it's changing. People are 
understandably anxious about technology. I think that um, the anecdote that best sums this up to me was a woman that we met in Manchester as part of our qualitative research who said to us, I have been punched in the face by an Uber driver and yet I continue to use Uber every week. Now I really think about that anecdote a lot because to me that kind of sums up the most brilliant metaphor for technology right now. We know that we have uh, been punched in the face to a degree, but we continue to use it every week. So I would like to argue here today that we need to change the new normal to responsibility. And I think that that is about system change. And it's not about any one small piece of society. It's got to be about us all coming together across three, the three axes. Civil society is represented so brilliantly here by all of you, governments and legislators, and the corporate sector itself. And if we take a systems approach and argue for um, an improvement in digital understanding at all levels of society and across all those axes, and we make changes across all of those pieces, then I think we have a good shot at making responsibility the new normal. So how are we going about this? And how do I believe we should build this? And how are Dot Everyone working on some of these things? Well, if we take each aspect of that pie, I'm going to start with perhaps the trickiest, something that I see partly from being in the strange second chamber of parliament in the UK, the House of Lords, as Mark mentioned. For those of you that don't know, the House of Lords is an unelected second chamber in the UK. We have the role to scrutinize and amend legislation. We don't have primacy of legislation, but we can suggest changes that the elected chamber may or may not um, approve. Normally they do approve it. I think 95% of the the changes that we suggested last year were taken um, on board by the government's um, elected chamber, the House of Commons. And I mention the House of Lords because it's a strange place. I am perceived as the kind of internet person in the House of Lords, and I very often get asked the question of how, why the Wi-Fi isn't working. That seems to be the thing that I'm mainly associated with. But it's very interesting because from my view there, I can see the challenge that legislators and policymakers face all around the world in keeping up with the pace of technological change. And arguably, one of the biggest gaps in our societies right now are between people who are making decisions about the public purse or about our directions of policy and the level of pace and change that's happening in the real world, or IRL, as my godchildren tell me I should say. <laughs> this is a big problem we need to crack. Um, at everyone, we've done some test projects. We did a training program with MPs um, locally in uh, the UK government where we matched them with a digital mentor, somebody not always younger, but um, always with the right skills to help them do everything from manage their BlackBerry to learn, learn about how they could use social media to talk to their constituents. We're now doing some work um, with City Hall, the mayor's office in the UK, and we're doing some work in the health service as well. And I believe that if by stealth we can help public sector leaders learn about the internet and upskill and have more level of understanding, then we will get a sea change in how we think about technology and the ability for us to make better decisions. And ultimately, that has to also come through in better regulation and more effective regulation. Too often right now, across the world, the internet and technology is used as the catch-all for the ills of society. No politician is going to lose votes right now for kicking tech. And that it's probably right to a degree, it needs some kicking, but as we saw with the congressional hearings last week for anybody that was watching, unless we have effective and uh, understanding um, regulation that enables innovation, appreciates the different business models online, then we're going to, I believe, go in danger of going backwards in all that technology can offer. So we need to upskill our legislators and we need to have effective and clear regulation. We need to have not knee-jerk regulation, but regulation that takes takes into account people and their needs as opposed to just the political football that tech can sometimes become. So that's to me the first piece of the puzzle. The second piece is about us as individuals. And this, again, is very interesting when you look at the research um, that we did in the UK that I, again, would be very interested to hear your views on. We found that, you know, no surprises, 90% of people think that terms and conditions that they find online are unacceptable and they don't understand them. But only 40% of people uh, said that they actually reviewed them and looked at them. You know, I'm still slightly staggered by that number. I think people might be, might be teasing us slightly. 
this is something we need to crack. We need to make it more understandable for all, the, all of us to know what that transaction is with the companies that are gathering our data and our privacy. But I don't believe that will happen unless we have much more imaginative ways of helping people navigate this world. And many of the things that I know people are working on in this room is to help general populations get more of a sense of accountability and transparency with what's happening online or with their governments using the digital tools available. But we also need to make sure that people are given the information that they have. And we're working on a public information campaign in the UK. We're calling it a digital public health campaign. So if you imagine a, the old no smoking campaigns of the past that uh, um, governments would do, we're building the equivalent, but for your digital health. What is it that you need to know? What is the things that will make you feel more robust and resilient in this digital world? How do we educate people about what their privacy settings should be, what the transaction is with some of the services that appear free on, on the internet? And I think that's a kind of interesting idea and be interesting to see where the results end up. So civil society and enabling us as individuals and organizations to be robust and have a good conversation about technology and put responsibility at the heart of how we um, interact online and the kind of choices that we make will be the second part of the pie chart to my mind. So you have the governments and legislation and good regulation. You have civil society coming together and producing more responsibility at both an individual level but also through the civil society organizations that you all know well. The final piece is obviously the corporates themselves. And one of the things that we've been working on again in the UK is a um, vanguard of responsible tech companies, companies that uh, are at different stages of their um, growth and um, their uh, journeys, who are going to put and embed a set of values about technology at the heart of how they build for the future. And I would like to get to a phase where responsible design was right at the core of how people worked and how they built their products and services. And what does that really mean? Well, we've come up with some, some principles that we think about responsible tech, and I'm going to read this so that I don't get them wrong and the team get cross with me. Some of the things that we've uh, worked on around what the definitions of responsible tech might be are that they, a responsible tech company or organization would not knowingly deepen in existing qualities, inequalities, or create new ones recognize and protect the inherent dignity and rights of all, and give people confidence and trust in their use. So I'll just go through those again. They wouldn't deepen existing inequalities or create new ones. They would recognize and protect the inherent dignity and rights of all, and they would give people confidence and trust in their use. Now there's a lot to unpick in those principles, but it'd be interesting to see and apply those to how you would build products and services and be cognizant of what some of the unintended consequences might be. So we're thinking a bit about how we can build a cohort of responsible tech organizations that would embed those values right at the start of their design principles. So I believe very strongly that the sector um, is at a moment of immense importance. People are watching to see how we hold the technology sector's feet to the fire. And it has to be a joined up approach and a systems based approach to thinking. You know, when I think back to my own journey of um, starting that business way back in the early dawn of time and how we didn't even really imagine what some of the unintended consequences of this technology might be. And now I sit on the board of Twitter and I, I'm on that board because I believe very much in the open nature of that platform and in its capacity to do good. But as we know, Twitter has, by its own admission, struggled with a lot of the challenges of unintended consequences. And Jack has recently announced a um, uh, right for people to um, give him proposals about how we might measure whether Twitter's impact on the public conversation is positive or negative and whether or not Twitter is helping society progress. And these may feel like small things, but they're big shifts in the culture of how Twitter will be run. So I feel as though with the span of the last 20 years, we've had the excitement and the froth of the dot-com early boom. We've had the excitement and the froth of, oh my goodness, we can connect up the world and now, it feels as though, perhaps it's because I'm 45, we're going through a bit of a midlife crisis. And we're thinking, oh my goodness, what have we created and what are these products and services? But I'm so still optimistic about the future because I think that as borne out by all the amazing things many of the people in this room are doing, we have still immense capacity for human reinvention and innovation. The 
ability for technology to transform relationships with government, us as citizens, our ability to organize, to find like-minded people and come together in a way that does not need to isolate us, can bring us more close. I think we'll look back on this time, the late 2018s, 19s, 20s, and think, oh my goodness, we really did sort a lot of stuff out. So we are one small part of that puzzle at Dot Everyone in the UK. We'd love to make friends. I've got Stav and Sam here in the front row um, from my team who would love to talk to you if you haven't met them already. It's an exciting moment to be building a movement around responsible technology. And I would love to make responsible the new normal. I would like to, that woman in Manchester to be able to reflect in another five years time and say, oh my goodness me, there's this other service that I know now and I use. And I shake the driver's hand every day when I get out of that cab and I slap them on the back. And maybe sometimes we might even go out for a drink because we shouldn't have to put up with services that are punching us in the face. So let's make responsible the new normal. Please join us and thank you for having me here today. So, quite a lot of stuff in there. I'd love to hear things you're up to that might feel relevant. Any questions that you have about anything over the last expanse of time that I have uh, inarticulately rambled through. Yes. I can't. Yeah, I'm going to move actually slightly out from the moment. Yes, I do. All right, hello. Hi. Hi. And as ever, Martha, thank you. And I think really helpful and, and a, a nice positive whilst acknowledging a lot of the challenges we're facing. And this is partly a reflection and then a question, which is, I think one of the things we're starting to grapple with is a much more overt sense of the need to manage power. And yes. that we are operating in power context and that. Yeah. And the bit for me, you won't be surprised to hear, I come from a co-op background, is that I think we need to start look at ownership more. Yeah. And if this isn't a, will you put the thing on Twitter agenda, but I think Twitter is part of them, the, you know, a, co a mutualization of some of these highly networked um, platforms in particular, I think has to, because rebuilding them is really hard mm. because of the network effects and the, the setup effects. So I think there's something about our sectors not understanding or knowing ownership well and mm. actually having to grapple with, engage with that. And I'd love your reflections on that, really. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for that, Karen. And, um I think you're right. I think one of my observations would be that, you know, I feel lucky. I started in the commercial world. I then did a lot of work in the UK government. We set up the government digital service and created gov.uk and a whole bunch of stuff with that, as always, um, with lots of its roots in what my society had originally proposed in the UK. And now I work a bit more predominantly in, in new, broadly the kind of not-for-profit sector. And it seems to me that you're sort of talking about silos and how you can, uh, the interrelationship between those different aspects. And it's still hard, I think, for the charitable sector and the private sector to work together. There's often suspicion on both sides or kind of angst or anger. Um, and it feels as though, you know, quite rightly, the non-commercial um, organizations are holding commercial organizations feet to the fire. They sometimes don't like that. And so that becomes a tense relationship. But I think that um, what your point about ownership and and the capacity for both sides to understand different models are very, very important. And I, I do think that um, there will be other things invented that we haven't yet seen. So while the immense power of Facebook is, you know, extraordinary and complex and nuanced, and we have to unpick, in my view, some of its immense power, I think that there will be huge opportunities, and you see it around the world in different countries as well, to have different models of ownership and different ways to build platforms. And I, so I don't feel um, pessimistic, actually. I think that we will look back in another 50 years and say, oh, actually, that was a period of time where there was this insane build build up of power these ownerships were very limited and the networks were actually not as effective as we've managed to recreate now so i i'm still optimistic that innovation will lead to change and you know never look back and say actually this would be dominant for 100 years that feels like a naive view to, to think that's the case yes at the back gentleman at the back Hi, thank you for your presentation, it was great. My name is Alvaro, I'm from Argentina, I work for the government of Buenos Aires City. Uh, Mike is there right now, I think, my colleague from, from the, we set up the digital service, he's doing some work with the government there right now, I think. Oh, great, I hope they enjoy the city. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you, I, I like your concept of uh, responsible technology, mm -hmm. and recently in, in Argentina and in Latin America, there's a, there, there has been a lot of controversy on the role 
of social networks in, yeah. in the public conversation. Yeah. And sometimes you know, governments are accused of having something to do in the you know, inappropriate use of social networks. Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, sometimes governments want to jump in and try to propose regulations mm. to, to solve those problems. And when that happens, there are, you know, uh, internet activists and civic tech organizations that tell the government to back off, that there should be no regulations yeah. in this field. So it's kind of an impossible game for mm -hmm. sometimes for, for governments. What's your feeling about the role of governments in this yeah. type of, in solving these type of problems? Yeah, I mean, it's a very hot topic of conversation around the world. And thank you for bringing Argentinian perspective, which I, I don't know well, though I'd love to visit Buenos Aires. Um, I, I think um, that it is interesting if you look at Europe, which I know perhaps best, the different models of um, government's relationship to social media. Again, as I say, I really think that right now, no politician is going to lose votes by knocking the internet um, it's, and technology companies. This is a vote winner. So that's a quite a dangerous position to be in. You know, it's dangerous from whatever angle of the tech sector you're working because we don't want politicians to undermine, in my mind, encryption or all the positive innovation or all of the big good things that have come from progress, I would say. So um, I think what you see in Europe is this kind of sporadic, um, different levels of um, government intervention and intention. So clearly in um, Germany, they have very specific social media regulation where companies are now fined quite substantial amounts of money. Very mixed reaction to how that's working out, whether it's actually preventing anything. In the UK, we have um, the, gov the minister has recently announced that he wants penalizing um, things around social media and children, so they focus quite strongly on children, and then the other stuff is going to be sort of a voluntary code that they're hoping the tech industry will build itself. So that's just some couple of European examples, you know, different examples over the world, I think, of how governments are approaching this. In the Philippines, I was reading about another different approach again and something else in Indonesia. So I don't know where it will end up, but I think that in the end, um, these companies, because of the limited um, power base, because they all basically come from one small area of the world, which is the west coast of America, ultimately paying attention a bit to what's happening in the world, but it's the US that will determine, I think, the changes of behavior. I think it's quite hard to know how that's going to play out. I don't quite know whether this Facebook drama is going to lead to a, in a big intervention in uh, and a joined up piece of US legislation. I'd be interested in other people's views. So to answer your question, I think it's going to be a bit haphazard and I think it's going to be lots of different things happening. And I think that in the end, the power still does reside in our, you know, um, in such a small bit of the world, which will pay attention when the US changes direction or does something. And I'm not clear how that's going to play out. What, what do you think? Yeah. Sorry, it's in a microphone. Uh, well, I think you know, it, um, regulations by governments should be extremely targeted and yeah. narrow. Uh, yeah. And I think the, the the main potential is for companies, for social media companies, to social uh, network, to to reform themselves, yeah. to to have their own regulations, to improve uh, their practices and their mechanisms for, on the one hand, preserving freedom of expression, yeah. but on the, on the other hand, preserving the, you know, the quality of the public yeah. debate. Yeah. I, I do agree with you that uh, these companies are, are, are called to improve the quality of democracy, mm. but we are still in a transition and there are so many things to yeah. be repair and tackle. Yeah. Thank and you. It, you know, it, it's complex because the cultural picture is very complex. You know, I see that from Twitter. It's you know, your deno denotion of what freedom of expression is, is very different to mine, I would suspect, and very different to what Jack in the US would think, you know, founder of Twitter. So we, we have all these cultural parameters as well. It's complex. And I think you know, this is a period of time where, again, as I say, I, I don't think we should get hysterical. I think we've got to be calm and see the long view of history and what we're trying to achieve and try and build, iterate products and services to help as I think Twitter are beginning to do. At the front, this gentleman. Making you run around with the microphone. <laughs> Hello, Sorry. thank Hi. you. Uh, I'm Michael Meyer Zender from Democracy Reporting, a Berlin-based organization with offices in many other places. Um, I find interesting that in the tech scene, and you mentioned it also, you use very much a frame of health. 
Yeah, yesterday yeah. morning we talked about framing, yes. and now is the idea this whole space has to become healthy. Yes. I find that a funny framing, yes. because it suggests something very biological, but yeah. it's very much about society mm. and society relations and relation between people. Mm. What I wonder a little bit is why we don't use other frames that are actually well established, like human rights, rule of law, yeah. democracy, which yeah. you know humanity has discussed already for a long time, where we have binding documents where everybody agreed on, things like freedom of expression, etc. Yeah. And uh, instead, we move to this health metaphor. For mm. me, it's a little bit makes a debate very hard to grab, mm. and uh, also detached from debates about society and mm. discussing society and relations in health terms, for me, it's odd. Would yeah, like no, that, that's interesting, and I agree with you. I, I, I don't use that expression myself. I'm relaying what Twitter are working on is one of the metrics they're trying to grapple with is whether that's a good way of uh, considering the public conversation, if you like. But Twitter is you know, one aspect. I'm uh, talking as me and dot everyone. I would say we're not really talking about health, and I would agree with you. What we're talking about is responsibility, and that's responsibility to building a society that works well in the digital world, and that's different. Of course, health is one aspect of that, but so is as we try to put in our principles not deepening existing inequalities, dignity and rights for all, which are already enframed in the rule of law. So I would agree with you. I think that reinventing notions is sort of helpful, but we also need to double down on things we know make society function. But I think, you know, just um, to put two minutes on what I think Twitter's trying to do, I think that there is a kind of growing consent idea in social sciences around what contributes to well-being and positive public engagement. And I think you know, that is a helpful sort of discussion to have. It's beyond just the rule of law and human rights. I think it's about, are we having a conversation where people are hearing each other and are we enabling society to make better decisions? Right, a lady behind you in green, hi. Hi, yeah, Hi. thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, yeah, we said a lot of things. Um, of course, we... Where are you from? Leave. Sorry. Can you oh, sorry. Yeah, I work, I'm from Italy. I work ah. for a small anti-corruption Italian NGO. Brilliant. And we thank use, you. obviously, the digital mean to reach out to our people, although Italy has a even broadband problems lacking broadband in some countries, yep. so in some regions. Yep. So actually, my so question do we. is... Yeah. So do we. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the of middle course. of London, where I live, no broadband. Anyway, that's another thing. <laughs> of course, yeah. In fact, like, uh, of course, we said we're living in interesting times, in a way. You said yeah. you were optimistic. I'm too. But um, you also said everything happens in the, that happens in the United yeah. States, in a way, will impact on the rest of the world. And I was also very intrigued by the concept of digital health, um, mm. uh, Right campaign you are um, launching, and I was wondering whether you, um, in a way, foresee or tackle the problem of the abolition of net neutrality, which in the mm. United States has taken place. Because I mean, uh, we haven't talked about this in this conference, but I wonder how worried is the, everyone that this could have an effect on us, and should we all worry about it, even mm. here in Europe? I just wanted to know your thought on that. Yeah, it's interesting. I. Um, I was coming back to my hotel in San Francisco on a trip and there was a bunch of people on the street uh, doing a demonstration about net neutrality. And I thought, wow, only in San Francisco. I cannot imagine in London a bunch of people getting out on the street and campaigning the concept of net neutrality. Maybe I'm doing my fellow Londoners a disservice. Um, it's very important. I have... I'm not um, in the detail enough to know really how it might affect us in Europe and the wider world, but, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, the, it doesn't take, um, I believe, much to really um, understand that the principles on which the internet is based, as in, you know, fairness and equitable access for all, are being undermined with this debate. So it is important. It is still fairly limited to a U.S. forum, but, you know, the danger is, I guess, that other bits of the world will adopt the same strategy. But it's not something that not everyone is directly working on, but I think all of us as uh, internet users and activists should be taking it very seriously. I also always take my cue from Tim Berners-Lee. I think he's generally quite a good person to get your moral compass from, and he's been very, very active in saying this is a disaster. So I think we should follow Tim. Yeah, thank you. Maybe yeah. even in this forum and this conference, should, we should take like a, a collective stance on it and <laughs> thank you. campaign together for <laughs> it. Just a proposal. Good, thank you. Someone else? Anyone else? Here in the front, this lady? We can do two questions in the front, maybe we can double up. 
can we take both of them? Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Sunit, and I'm from the Institute of Global Change, and my work focuses on providing advisory services to governments in Africa. Um, so one is a very brief reflection and then a question. Yes. So it seems to me from your talk that there tends to be a conflation between uh, technology just as a means versus yep. the content that is provided. Yes. And, and that kind of leads to this sort of sometimes confused debate as to mm. where the responsibility yes. sits, whether yep. it's the responsibility of the platform provider or the immediate content provider and, and what implications there are for freedom. Mm. Um, so I think it might be useful to sort of distinguish that so yes. that no, technology as a whole doesn't yep. become the political football and then yep. you get into the content conversation. In terms of a question, the guidelines that you have um, shared with us, I mean, they seem great, but my question is, number, in terms of practical application, who determines whether those guidelines have been broken? Mm. And then what, are, yes. what is the consequence of that? What, where is the bite in these guidelines? And with, with respect to the former question about who gets to determine, there is a risk I see once you begin to apply these guidelines in different contexts, mm -hmm. because as to who is divisive yep. and, and to what extent you you minimize kind of constructive criticism, shall we say. You know, I can see that being a risk for a lot of civil society organizations yeah. and activists. So, so I'd be interested in yep. how you see the practical application playing out. Yes. Good question, thank you. Um, hi, Martha, my name's Tom Miller. Um, I work for the European Commission. <laughs> I think we might have been at university together, but we can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but I, I like this I idea of- much uh, of university. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, r responsibility is a new normal, and mm. uh, I think that's a very useful concept. And maybe in, in developing uh, the developed countries where we have rule of law and uh, separation of powers and yep. strong institutions and fourth estate and so on, maybe that's a bit easier to usher in. But I work on development and mm. in developing countries where many of those things don't exist or only yep. partially exist, and also. Um, you have those huge power asymmetries already, um, to which to some degree the, the, the internet, social media and other technological changes are, are worsening. Um, what would you say to development partners like us uh, about how we can usher in this yeah. new level of responsibility, not just for already well-developed countries, but developing countries which yeah. in many ways could be heading off in the wrong direction in some areas? Thank you. Oh, two easy peasy questions. I will attempt. I will attempt. Uh, firstly, I think you're absolutely right, and uh, my uh, inarticulate ramblings are not distinguishing probably enough between the kind of infrastructure technology layer and the content on top of it. You know, it becomes murky because you know, is Amazon a piece of content or is, is it a tech, you know? It's so I think there's. You're right to draw that distinction. I personally think we get too bogged down in whether these companies are publishers or platforms or whatever the hell they're trying to not be because they don't want a particular type of regulation. You know, there's still something fundamentally to go back to people, which is that people feel uneasy about the level of um, opaque, the opaque nature of some of these products and services. And I think if you keep going back to what people are thinking about it, then it's a sort of helpful distinction. Um, and I. So, but I take your point, we need to be careful what we're talking about, the technology, or we're talking about the layer on top of the technology. I think that's absolutely valid. And now I've forgotten the second part of your question. I'm really sorry. How are you going to apply that? Oh, yes, the application, a vital part of all of this, absolutely. You know, and the principles, you know, it's a bit like when you write these things down on a piece of paper, any kind of code of contact, code of conduct, like, so what? But I think what we're trying to do is just frame some ideas that we will start to see whether or not we can implement with some things. Because this is a movement, right? We're going to build responsible technology. We're going to have some people that are going to gobble it up and build products and services in maybe a slightly different way to how they might have done in the past. And some people will reject it. And then over time, the way we think about it, or I think about it sometimes, is think about fair trade movement in uh, fashion and food. And I used to be on the board of a retailer called Marks & Spencer in the UK. And you know, I remember when I first joined the board, the kind of, it was such a niche thing, fair trade, people sort of paid attention to it, but Marks & Spencer was actually one of the most sustainable retailers in the world. And it really uh, drove this as an agenda. And over time, it became the normal, because actually it wasn't okay for even very much bigger retailers like Tesco not to have a much more transparent supply chain. And of course, there's still a whole lot of terrible things that happen, but it has moved considerably. But not everyone buys fair trade bananas and buys fair trade clothes, but the movement itself has created change in the mainstream. So that's what I'm hoping if we talk about responsible technology and we show practical applications like how you should build a product and service with good terms and conditions, much clearer data, 
privacy transaction and relationship, you know, right from the get-go, thinking about children and default settings for them, then over time that might apply pressure to the bigger mainstream players. So that's one aspect, and that's what we're doing with one of our cohorts of organizations. Then the other aspect is about um, helping uh, regulators and legislators and public policy people, as I said, understand a bit more about technology so that they can help play their part, back to the first question in terms of regulation and how we can um, innovate around that. You know, there is going to be regulation, more regulation of technology. There just is. It's kind of inevitable. The danger is if it's bad and it doesn't help um, make the technology do what it should be able to do, which is empower more people as opposed to just a couple of people in the tech world get really, really rich. So I think that there are loads of different bits in that puzzle I was trying to demonstrate around us as individuals, the corporate sector, and the legislature and the policy world, where we're trying to do some projects to see if we can help move the dial and embed what responsible technology means. Does that hopefully answer your question a bit? Um, to your point about the developing world, yes. I mean, I'm not trying to make a case for um, much beyond technology becoming more responsible as opposed to governments trying to become more responsible. That feels somewhat outside my job spec. Um, but I think that you know, what I've seen is that there's a, and it feels like it here and listening to what you guys have been telling me since I arrived is there is a, there has been for a long time, but now is the moment perhaps where people who have been talking a lot more about what we as individuals can use technology for to empower us as opposed to just ordering another pizza on the internet or getting a cheap pair of shoes. This is a moment that this is shifting, that the products and services are becoming more important and more meaningful for people. And people want to see how technology can help shape beyond just their own um, self-interest. They want to see how it can shape society. And I think all you can do is just start, right? So, you know, I would encourage people to just start and to um, share and swap ideas and stories and you know that's what our aspiration for everyone would be to be able to be a bit more of a convener in the center of some of this stuff to help people spread stories but you know doesn't uh, I've heard stories from all over the world of people who are building tech products that are you know much more for good than not for good and that is the beginning of you know what I would argue is going to be the wave of the next generation of technology so I'm actually as you can tell optimistic about this stuff well being skeptical over here, let's take these two gentlemen's questions. We've got about five more minutes, I think. Five, ten, yeah. Uh, it's a really easy one. Um, oh, good. So, uh, in your role in the House of Lords, yep. you've, like you well, say. Who are you and where do you come sorry, from? Sorry, Alex Blanford, Democracy Club. Hello. Hi. Um, you're one of around 900 peers, and you're also. I mean, we've had problems in the House of Commons not having quite the right level of tech expertise. Yep. I don't mean to put the weight of the world on your shoulders here. What are you doing about improving our legislature's ability to deal yep. with more, to understand more regulation of the internet? And I appreciate it's not your responsibility, but no, you're, no, right. you're the only person there. No, no, I'm not. I'm really not. I'm really not. It's quite, can we just take the other gentleman's question as well and then... Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Margo. I come from uh, Citizen OS in Estonia. Um, Hello. I, I very much thank you for your presentation. Very much believe in putting uh, values at the core of, yeah. of developing um, new tools and solutions. I was wondering what your, in, in respect to the first sort of guideline, um, which if I wrote it down correctly, was not knowingly deep in existing inequalities. Yeah. I'm not sure about the research pertaining to UK or other countries, but in Estonia, all research points to age-related uh, yeah. digital divide yeah. where, you know, yeah. even in a, ver in a very connected country, yeah. skills drop off after age 65 or yes. so. Yes. And with countries in Europe looking at aging populations, yes. people who are aged 65 yeah. or more, they have 20, 30, maybe 40 years of, of mm -hmm. lifetime. Um, and and when we're building, um, like if, if people over 65 don't know how to buy yes. a pair yes. of shoes online, that's yep. less dramatic. If we're building um, sort of civic tech solutions yes. that are supposed to be making democracy be better and making yep. it more accessible to people, then it, it's much more of a a burden not to deepen that age-related yes. digital divide. So I was just wondering yes. how concerned you are about yes. that and what's your thoughts yeah. on that? Good question, thank you. Um, okay, to answer your first question, I think there's a kind of institutional thing we're doing is not everyone, then there's just me. So um, as I said, everyone's working on a bunch of projects to try and help um, 
both elected officials and unelected officials like the Lords, as we did this mentoring program with MPs, which was small scale, but very effective. And all the MPs loved having um, their digital understanding raised. So we're now trying to secure funding to extend that. We're doing some work with select committees because we thought actually, as opposed to empowering just the individual, why don't we help the actual work? So we've got some proposals out to how we could help select committees, which are scrutinizing aspect of um, our governmental system look at what they're scrutinizing with a bit more of a technology lens. So I guess that's focusing more on the work than the individual. So that's what Dot Everyone is up to. And you know, any funders out there who'd like to give us more money to ramp that program up and do it across the world, brilliant. Um, for me personally, yes, I mean, that I applied to be in the House of Lords, right? There's a lot of people who get appointed, and then there are two people a year who can apply to become independent peers like me. And um, I applied because I thought I've enjoyed this public policy work I've done in government, and I want to try and contribute. It's a funny old place, and so I'm, you know, I don't mean to sound grand or arrogant. I'm one person, and I just try and do two things. I try and be present and talk about technology because it's, you know, in a health debate, you'll be amazed how many people don't even mention the internet, back to health, or even, you know, in a national security debate, no one mentions cyber. So I just try and be present and talk about this stuff, which hopefully, you know, just changes the bit of the dynamic. And then the second thing is um, I'm amassing a group of peers with me who um, are interested in how we might be able to lead a bit more on thinking about some models of regulation and um, innovation and policy. So you know, there are different levers you can pull in the Lords. I sit on the Joint Committee for National Security Strategy, which is a joint committee with the House of Commons looking and overseeing the national security strategy. And it's been really interesting in that because you've got MPs and peers and the MPs, the elected officials are have such a different, um, obviously, motivation of, and uh, political game that they're trying to play. They're all, you know, very effective, very many of them. And the peers have a completely different role again. And it's how you bring together those two aspects of our um, governmental system and make sure that both are equipped for what they need to, in the modern world. And it's it's not easy, but I'm trying my small bit. <laughs> um, and your question, I've now totally forgotten. Did I answer it already? No. <laughs> um, yes. The digital divide. Well, this is something I worked on a lot in the UK. You know, it's, it's easy to forget that half the world is still not on the internet, right? It's very easy to forget that. And although the rate of pace is accelerating, I believe it is a responsibility of governments. I believe this so strongly, especially in the light of what's been happening with Facebook. I don't want Mark Zuckerberg to be the person connecting the world. I really don't. I feel this as an enormous point of philosophy, the philosophical principle. Some people might disagree. It makes me very, very uncomfortable if that is who we're going to let make sure this basic human right is um, enabled around the world. So I think it is the responsibility of governments. I did work just parochially in the UK. We have about 10 million people uh, in the UK who don't use the internet. It's often, uh, unsurprisingly, um, older people and very poor people. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that when we're building products and services, we build it for people who are not connected as much as who are, and we have to work out how to get that bit connected. But we shouldn't just assume that it's the internet and digital is the answer, as you know, I heard in the panel previous to the break. It's often you know the phone or other world solutions that we need to make sure we help people transition through. So I think things need to be digital because we're living in 2018, not 1818. But we have to be cognizant of human needs and people at the heart of whatever products and service we're designing. For for example, do everyone built something for people who are dying? It might seem a strange cohort of people to choose to build something for, but it was one of the first projects we did. We build stuff as well as talk about stuff. And um, we chose people who are dying because I thought if you can help people at that most hideous piece of their lives, and you can show that technology can help in an effective way, then you can basically show that by using the furthest first as the example, you can build something for the vast majority of people in the middle, if that makes sense. And of course, it wasn't because the people who are dying are often bashing around on the internet, but it was because the people caring for them, the doctors looking after them, didn't have a way of collaborating around simple bits of information and data about that person. And so what we were we discovered is that if you're dying on average, you have 40 different people in your care because you might have a physio, you might have a kidney specialist, you might have an incontinence expert, you might have a carer, you might have a relative. It's a lot of people and there was no central way to look at information. So what we built was a very simple collaborative healthcare record. Very, very simple, very simple tech, but it started from the human need that they just wanted to be able to see all of the 
information about them. And that was as true if you were a doctor as if you were a carer as if you were the patient. So I think if you start with the person and you build the product and service from there, that's the way you should do it. But it is absolutely vital we do not lose sight of how many people are not able to access technology for whatever reason. And to me, that is a social and moral um, cause that we must just keep talking about all the time. Okay, one more question. The lady at the back in the red top, been patiently waiting with your hand up. Let's, please make it an easy one. <laughs> you all must be exhausted of hearing me. My brain is shrinking. <laughs> Uh-oh. Hi, uh, thank you for a great talk. I'm Louise from My Society. Hello. I wondered what your thoughts are on the relationship between responsibility and technology and the extent to which technology is understood by the people who use it. Yeah. It feels like if you don't, understood, you don't understand the tool you're using, then you are being done to by it yes. rather than yes. doing something with it. Yes. Um, um, we live in an age where we don't understand everything. Yeah. Nobody, even working in technology, understands the full stack. Yes. But if you don't understand yes. the business model, I that agree. seems dangerous. I totally agree with you. Um, and you know, this is a huge part of the work that we're, we're doing at Dot Everyone. You know, back to the gentleman's question about the digital divide. You know, if you have a set of um, people who've never used the internet, it's quite easy in a way to tick off a set of check boxes. Can they? Do they have basic digital skills? Can they search safely online? Can they you know, perform a transaction? Can they do whatever bunch of things you determine that they should be able to do? It's much harder to then say, OK, that might be the low level of, OK, you can use the internet, to then move to, do you understand it? What is that relationship that we all need to feel a bit more empowered by? To make people feel as though um, you know, the 12% of people who uh, feel that it's uneasy what technology is doing society to be 92%. And this is something we're thinking about a lot. So we talk a lot about digital understanding and what that is and what that means. You know, is that just um, being able to know how to ask the questions of the service you're using? Is it that you understand what the transaction is all the time? That you, if you're putting your data out there, you understand about that? Is it that you know how to find the privacy settings on various app you're using, different metrics and things that we're looking at. And that's why we're working on this. It's not about health, but it's a digital public health campaign, which we hope will be a wide scale, just in the UK initially, um, attempt to help people be able to ask the questions about technology that you're implying are really important and that we would absolutely agree with you are important. So we're going to have working with a um, big media partner to build out messages so that people can understand a bit more about what it is that they are doing when they're using technology and feel a bit more empowered by it and a bit less anxious. But to me, that isn't about a checklist of things. It's more about a frame of mind and a cultural way of behaving, you know, feeling as though you are the driver, not that you're being driven in a, um, in a scary way. So I totally agree with you. I think that this is an, a huge, enormous challenge. It's not something that ever ends. You know, so the, the parameters will be moving and shifting all the time, but it's about resilience and about the cultural ability to keep asking the right questions and feel like we do still have choices in all of this. We don't have to have it done to us. That feels like a good place to end. Thank you for being such a kind audience and asking some